There's three core ills which are very destructive. Number one, shuhtun muta'ah. Greed which is submitted to. Greed which is submitted to. Number two, wahawan muttaba. Desires which are seeded to. They are followed. Wahawan muttaba. Wa i'ajabul marhi bi nafsi. And the third thing is i'ajabul marhi bi nafsi. Pride, conceitedness. Jeremy Bentham, he said that nature has placed mankind under, under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. Human beings, we require a purpose beyond immediate pleasures. Three in ten households consist of one person. That's a thing in the West. You know, in the back home, you go to a house, and there's like 20 people almost always at home. Only 30% of Americans think that they can reliably trust one another. There's a breakdown in social cohesion that I talked about. My dear brothers, elders, and sisters in Islam, Jazakumullah khair, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you ajr alim for joining us in this event, Project Ahdiyah and Georgia Islamic Institute welcome you to the first of, inshallah, hopefully a series of halaqat and very on, very, very pertinent topics and very important topics. The intention is hopefully month by month we'll be hosting this event at different, different locations so that, you know, we can inshallah interact with multiple communities and inshallah spread the benefit throughout the greater Atlanta area. Uh, regarding the topic today, it is a very important topic, especially in Western civilization where we are currently facing, always facing an onslaught of modernity and other things that are driving us to become slaves of our sensual pleasures. And so the topic today about addressing the vices such as greed, hyper-individualism, hedonism, these kind of things that are stripping our iman, our spirituality, the topic is hopefully inshallah going to be addressing this from multiple different different directions you know how this affects economies how this affects families how it affects our day-to-day -day life as a muslim it's a very very pertinent very very important topic uh inshallah for those who are joining us for the first time and don't recognize the speaker this is Mulana asadullah khan and uh he's a graduate from darul uh, ulum zakaria in south africa he also holds a bet, uh, bachelor's in philosophy from the university of georgia so uh, we are very, very honored to have this esteemed speaker and shall enlighten us on this very, very important topic. Jazakumullah khair wa barakallahu feekum. Once again, for the ladies, if there's ladies in the small masjid, they may make their way to the big masjid. And shall we have drawn the curtain in between. Uh, if they are accompanied by children and they wish to stay in the small masjid with the children, they are more than welcome. But inshallah, anyone who wants to come attend in the main event, they can come and join us in the big masjid. And inshallah, after the program, there'll be very light snacks and refreshments. So inshallah, you are more than welcome to change. Jazakumullah khair wa barakallahu feekum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salli wa sallimu ala al-mabhuti rahmatan lil alameen. Sayyidina wa habibina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. Wa man ihtada bi hadihi wa sunna bi sunnatihi ila yawm adhim. Amma ba'du fa'a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. ألم يأتكم نبأ الذين كفروا من قبل فذاقوا وبال أمرهم ولهم عذاب أليم ذلك بأنهم كانت تأتيهم رسلهم بالبينات فكفروا وتولوا واستغنى الله والله غني حميد والله غني حميد زعم الذين كفروا أن لن يبعثوا قل بلى وربي لتبعثون ثم لتنبؤون بما عملتم وذلك على الله يسير فآمنوا بالله ورسوله والنور الذي أنزلنا والله بما تعملون خبير وعن أنس بن مالك رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ثلاث مهلكات شح مطاع وهوى متبع وإعجاب المرء بنفسه أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم respected elders dear brothers and sisters First, I would just like to welcome and thank everybody for coming to Majib Yahya. I know Hafiz Fuad, he introduced me as if I'm some kind of a guest here. My own masjid, I think everyone knows me. But Jazakumullah khair for everyone coming and attending and being a part of this. The ayat which I recited in the beginning, and we'll get right into it, because we don't have a lot of time, we have about half an hour or so, 40 minutes. The ayat which I recited in the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tells us in Surah Al-Taghabun Alam Ya'tikum has there not come to you Nabahu Al-Ladheena Kafaroo Min Qabl The stories of those that came before 
But that, what about them? أمرهم, that the disbelievers that came before, they ended up tasting the consequences of their own actions. And on the Day of Judgment, they will have a painful عذاب and a painful punishment. Why? That was because their messengers came to them with clear signs, clear proofs, clear teachings. They disbelieved in them and they turned away from those teachings. Allah says, I don't need them. I didn't need them. They needed the teachings. Allah is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anyone. Hamid, he's perfect. He's all praiseworthy. He doesn't need anything. He's perfect in his attributes. Wallahu ghaniyun hamid. Why did they do this? Za'ma al-ladhiyyina kafaru allan yub'atu. The kuffar, they thought that they would not be resurrected one day. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe that there is a day of accountability to come. Za'ma al-ladhiyyina kafaru allan yub'atu. Qul, tell them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bala, indeed, latub'athunna, certainly you will be resurrected. And then you certainly will be informed of your actions. And resurrecting you, that is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Holding you accountable, that is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how to avoid that situation? فَآمِنُوا So believe. In what? بِاللَّهِ In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَرَسُولِهِ His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَالنُورِ النَّبِي أَنزَلْنَا And the nur which we have revealed, the Qur'an, the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the teachings of the Qur'an. وَالنُورِ النَّبِي أَنزَلْنَا وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرٌ Remember, if you do not follow the teachings of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the teachings of the Qur'an, or the teachings of the Qur'an and the teachings of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is well aware of your actions. It is easy for Him to hold you accountable. What do we understand from these ayat? By the way, I'm going to talk a little bit fast so I can cover as much ground as possible. What do we understand from these ayat? We understand that if we turn away from the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we turn away from the teachings of the Qur'an itself, then we will taste wabal, we will taste the consequences of going away from that path, from the teachings of the Anbiya. And we will, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us, face that adab in the hereafter as well. Today, we live in a world of darknesses. We live in a world of darknesses. People are trying to navigate the darknesses all around us. And you know, everywhere they turn, everywhere they go, they find themselves going deeper into this maelstrom of confusion and, you know, misdirection. And unfortunately, Muslims are no exception to this. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the torch, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the light, as the ayat which I just recited, Allah ta'ala calls it, وَالنُورِ الَّذِي أَنزَلْنَا I gave them the light. In another ayat of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ قَدَ جَاءَكُمْ بُرْحَانٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ نُورًا مُبِينًا That, O mankind, a clear proof has come to you and we have revealed to you نُورًا مُبِينًا A very clear light. قَدَ جَاءَكُمْ مِّنَ اللَّهِ نُورٌ وَكِتَابٌ مُبِينًا In another ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there has come to you a nur. Here is talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is also a guiding light for us. قَدَ جَاءَكُمْ مِّنَ اللَّهِ نُورٌ وَكِتَابٌ مُبِينًا so both Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a light. The Qur'an is a light. We have these lights with us, yet we are also lost in these darknesses. Why? Because we have for some reason forgotten that these are useful. We have forgotten to turn on our lights. For whatever reason, we have begun to follow everyone else and their misguidance. Remember these darknesses, they're transitive. These illnesses, these sins, they're transitive, meaning one darkness leads to another darkness. When we step into the first one, that's why in Sharia there's this thing of Saddu Dharaya, to kind of stop the problem from the very beginning. But what happens is that when we step into the first darkness, the first ill, the first sickness, the first sin, that leads us to other sins. A person who steals, he'll eventually have to lie. The person who drinks alcohol, he'll eventually hurt either himself or someone else inevitably. It leads to a lot of other problems. That's why there is this concept in Islam of major sins. What are major sins? 
major sins are those core or those high level problems and, and, and sins from which moral degradation cas cascades down. It ruins society. It leads to a number, a host of other issues. So these darknesses are transitive. And that's why the Quran gives very stern warnings. The ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it gives stern warnings against these core illnesses. I call them illnesses, we call them darknesses, we call them sins. These are core illnesses and darknesses. Nowadays, we see all these all around. We see the symptoms of it all around. And we are trying to deal with the symptoms. Oh, the divorce rate is up. Oh, their suicide rates are up. Oh, the crime rate is up. Oh, drug epidemic. Oh, this epidemic. Oh, that epidemic. These are the symptoms of those core ills. What are those core ills? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many a times they guide us towards those core ills. And we look at them and we say, yeah, it's like a simple statement, greed is bad. Yeah, okay, whatever. But we don't realize that that's where it starts and this is where it's left us. This is where it's brought us. The wabada amrihim that was mentioned in that ayah. The consequences of it are very severe. The hadith I recited in the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lays out three of those core ills which are, we're going to discuss in today's halaqah. What are those three core ills? Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Thalath muhlikatun. There are three ills which are destructive to an individual, to a society. Thalath muhlikatun. There's three core ills which are very destructive. Number one, shuhun muta'ah. Greed which is submitted to. Greed which is submitted to. Number two, wahawan muttaba. Desires which are ceded to, they are followed. And the third thing is pride, conceitedness. Now we may think that, okay, we've heard about these things being bad, you know, Allah, yeah, we know they're bad. But we don't realize that these illnesses, these core illnesses, are what defines the world view of majority of the people, especially in the Western world. Let's change, let's, let's reword these and let's talk about these in modern parlance. What is greed? Greed has manifested itself today in unfettered capitalism. I know it's not on the flyer, but I'm going to use a word that we've heard before. I'm not saying capitalism in itself, there's aspects of capitalism which are fine. Islam is about competition and that and markets and there's nothing wrong with that. But unfettered capitalism, shuhun muta'ah, when the wealth becomes the objective and the arbiter of what's good and what's bad. In Islam, in Islam, wealth is not the objective, it's not the end. Islam is a tool to get you towards things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put value in. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that spend on the poor. How are you going to do it? You're going to use wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said take care of your family. How are you going to do it? Use your wealth. That's why in the Quran and the Sharia ah, we find that Wealth is praised also and is disparaged also, right? It's disparaged a lot more because most people, they are weak when it comes to wealth. As soon as they get wealth, what happens? They don't make the right choices. They don't make the right decisions. Unfortunately, this has, wealth has become muqaq. It has become the arbiter. Look in the world we live in today, right? Where wealth is deciding for us what is right and wrong. The defense companies, they are the arbiters of war. They decide, you know, how much war we're going to have. The pharmaceutical companies, they're lobbying for weaker health. Special interest groups, whether they're LGBTQ or whatever, they're lobbying for more perverse values and principles. And the justification is easy, there's more, there's more money in it. They're able to give more money, so it, it, it is the one that decides whether these things are good or not. I was reading the other day that the war in Afghanistan, the 20 years, they lobbied $1 billion for that war, the defense companies. And they made a return of $2.02 trillion. Now you have to be blind to ask, why was that war the America's longest war? Why was it so long? They made a profit of, I don't know, you can do the math. They spent a billion and they made $2.02 trillion. That's a good enough justification to spill blood. 
Right? To make more money, pharmaceutical companies, how much do they lobby the politicians? Who's putting money? Whoever has more money, they are the ones who decide now what value society has to follow. They are the ones who are telling us what principles to follow. When we say that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first destructive ill that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in this hadith is greed. And it leads to this world of just rampant, unbridled capitalism that we find today where money is the end all and be all. And this leads to a whole host of problems in society. I'm only going to mention like three of them. And I could go on, this whole talk would be just about this. But I'll just mention three of those ills. You know, the first one is exploitation. Greed leads to exploitation. You know, in the capitalistic world, I don't have to say much about it. Everybody knows about the sweatshops of Asia, and we know about the mines of Africa, and we know about the wars where things are exploited within different countries for the sake of, uh, you know, harnessing the resources and that. This is all greed that's driving a lot of it. Exploitation of human beings. That's why in a hadith, in a similar hadith of Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that al-dhulm dhulmatun yawm al-qiyamah. That dhulm and injustice will come on the day of judgment in the form of many darknesses. وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالْفَحْشِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْفَحْشَ وَالْتَفَحْشِ And beware of immodesty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love immodesty and being immodest. وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالشُّحْ He mentions the same three ills. وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالشُّحْ فَإِنَّ الشُّحْحَ أَهْلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ And beware of this greed, this un... this... this... this muda'ah. When you make greed, you know, when money becomes your end game, your end goal. Beware of that. وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالشُّحْ فَإِنَّ الشُّحْحَ أَهْلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ It destroyed nations before you. أَمَرَهُمْ بِالْقَطِيعَةِ فَقَطَعُوا وَأَمَرَهُمْ بِالْبُخْلِ فَبَخِلُوا وَأَمَرَهُمْ بِالْفُجُورِ فَفَجَرُوا That it, co it commanded them. Look, greed has the commanding power. It commanded them to sever relations, they severed them. It commanded them to be miserly to one another, they became miserly. It commanded them towards sins and immodesty and they became sinful and immodest. In a hadith of Jarir radiallahu ta'ala, he adds, حَمَلَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْ سَفَكُوا دِمَاءَهُمْ وَاسْتَحَلُّوا مَحَارِمَهُمْ That it encouraged them to spill one another's blood. What's happening today? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it at that time, it's manifesting in front of our eyes. It's fully clear in front of our eyes where it has led to. So number one, exploitation. And you know, it's not just exploiting the weak. Sometimes we think that all the weak are exploited. No, it's exploiting even the affluent. There's a book written by John Kenneth Galbraith. It's called The Affluent Society. He's making a case in one of the chapters by what he calls the dependence effect. In which he makes the case that even the affluent, no matter how rich you think you are, you are also being exploited by greed. Because the one who is more richer than you is going to exploit you. The producers are going to exploit you. He calls it the dependence effect. What is the dependence effect? There's this idea, or there was this idea in capitalism, that was called consumer sovereignty. Consumer sovereignty means that the consumer's preferences is going to drive production. Right? The consumer, what he, what he needs, that's going to drive production. So when, whenever they have needs, production is going to increase. But that leads to a paradox. That leads to a paradox that runs contradictory to the requirements of greed. Greed wants that there should always be production, and production should always be increasing. And the paradox is that when the needs of the consumer is met, when the needs of the consumer is met, then production has to stop and slow down. So big problem. How do we solve this problem? Well, let's make it that the market, the production doesn't run on the preferences of the consumer. Production should be controlled by the producer. How? So now the producer has a job. The job of the producer now is to convince you that you are continuously and perpetually in need. That's why when the producers make a product, when the producer produces something, he spends an equal amount of money, billions of dollars to advertise, to convince you that you need it also. That this is a need of yours. Pleasures have become needs. I have the iPhone 14, now I need the iPhone 14.1. You don't need it. But you have been convinced that this is a need of yours. 
So now, the whole society is running to harness all of these extra pleasures that they feel like they can't live without. And when that production grows up, the rich become richer, their pockets become fatter. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you told us to protect yourself. Protect yourself from this cycle of exploitation. How al ghina ghina nafs You have a tool as a Muslim. What is that? Contentment. Be content. You'll be rich. You will be rich in the sense that you will never be able to be exploited by someone else. As long as you feel like you're in need, you're never rich. You're going to be poor. You're going to be exploitable. So number one, exploitation. Number two, fragmentation. This unfettered capitalism and greed, it leads to fragmentation of society. Why? Because profit over community. It doesn't matter what, uh, what rela relationships don't matter. They're not as valuable as money. Cohesion doesn't matter. It's not as valuable as money. As long as I got rich, who cares about what that guy thinks? Isn't that sort of the mindset today? Who cares about morals? Who cares about what's right and what's wrong? Who cares about if he suffers or they suffer? As long as I'm making money. And that causes fragmentation in society. Because nobody will trust the other person. Everyone says that he's just out to get money. He is just out to make money. I don't trust anyone. No, there's no trust. Society is not built on trust anymore. It fragments. That's why in the hadith of Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As ta'ala, we mentioned first, Amarahum bil qati'ati faqata'u. That it commands them to sever relations and they'll do it. Why? Because the money is more important than the relations. So it creates fragmentation. Number three, corruption. Do I have to say anything about corruption? I mean, any one of us, if we go back to our countries, and corruption is the norm. The exception is honesty. Corruption has become the norm. And we think that the West is safe from it? No. It's been built into the system, actually. In the West, we say, mashallah, everything's working so beautifully. In that. No. There is corruption here, but it's built so beautifully into the system, you think that it's, you know, Every politician here is paid. This is, I'm not giving you some you know, secret information or making things up. This is available online. So everyone is screaming about it. Both parties are accusing the other one. That you take money from uh, Big Pharma. Oh, you take money from this party. You take money from APAC. You take money from the defense companies. You take money from uh, all, these, you know, all these different uh, lobbies. That's called corruption where the producers and the businesses and the companies and the greedy people on the top, they hire and they bring in these politicians to convince you that the laws and the things that are going to be implemented are right. You need to put the politician in power for that. You don't agree with that, but the politician, he's the man, he's, he's now like a advertiser. It's kind of like the same dependence effect we talked about when it comes to production. He is now the advertiser. He's going to be the spokesman for all of these lobbies and rich and greedy people. He's going to be the spokesman to convince the general public that I'm working for your benefit. That's why it happens almost every election cycle. We all vote for somebody, they get in power, then they do everything that we didn't want them to do. They couldn't make any positive. They'll do one, two things just so that they can say they did it. But in reality, even those one, two things, they do it in a way which is beneficial for their donors. Corruption. It's the same greed, the same old rule that hasn't changed. Human nature doesn't change that much. Human nature, the same greed is, is the guiding principle. Number four, it leads to hedonism. And hedonism is the second thing mentioned in the hadith. Why do I say it leads to hedonism, greed? Why? Because when there's more money lying around and people have that money and they want to spend it on pleasures and pleasures, following and their needs are fulfilled. Now they have extra money lying around. Right? They're fighting for money so that they can now fulfill pleasures. And these things are connected, whether it's greed, whether it's hedonism, individualism, all of these illnesses, they're interconnected. They work together. One cannot work nicely without the other one. So hedonism. Now people, they feel like their pleasures, this is now the objective of their life. You know, society in the West has removed God from the picture. So now all of these other gods are there in, on the top, which now command them what to do, whether it's money, whether it's pleasure, right? Money and pleasure, these are like the two biggest ones. 
So the second thing mentioned in the hadith is awal muttaba'. Desires that are heeded to, that are followed. They command you. Ibn Qadama al-Maqdisi rahimahullah, he says that, you know, your pain and your pleasure, these themselves are not the arbiters of what's right and what's wrong. These are only motivating tools to get you to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like money is a tool for to get to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put value in, in the same way pain and pleasure are also motivating tools to get you to what is right and what, to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put benefit and value in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you that there is value in a family unit. So there is pleasure, there is pleasure in that. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us the harms of drinking alcohol. And there's pain in that. If you think the person who is drinking, he's getting a little bit of pleasure, but then he has a ton of pain as well. These are there to tell you that something is wrong here. So they're motivating that. But now in the West, what we've done is we've turned these two things into the arbiters of right and wrong. That if it feels good and, you know, it makes me happy, we've, we've attached happiness with short-term pleasure. If we're happy, so then it must be good. And this is actually a, a teaching of the you know, liberal philosophers. Jeremy Bentham, he said that nature has placed mankind under, under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. Two sovereign masters. Who do we say is a sovereign? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a sovereign. He says that no, no, mankind has been, nature has placed mankind under two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do. Yani pain and pleasure have the exclusive right to tell us what we should do, what is right and what is wrong, and what we will do. He was a determinist, meaning that if it's pleasurable, then we're going to end up doing it. Then we're going to end up doing it. There's a whole thing philosophically about um, ethical hedonism, and, and, but we don't want to get into the philosophy of it. The point is that this is kind of a principle that society lives on today. That if it feels good and it makes me happy, then this is, this is what I need to do in life. Whereas in Islam, that's not the driving factor of what is right and what is wrong. The driving factor is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us. Yes, eventually, sometimes, it will, it will take some difficulty, some pain, some discomfort, but it will get you to that place of happiness, true happiness. Whereas on the other side, you will have a temporary element of, of happiness, but it will lead you to destruction at the end. So some of the things that it has done to our society, number one, short-term <coughs> pleasure, pleasure addiction. Hedonism, the sort of hedonistic lifestyle that people live today, it has led number one to short-term pleasure addiction. We're addicted to short-term pleasures, whether it's consumerism, whether it's yani, uh, unsustainable lifestyles, whether it's negative, uh, negating our responsibilities, because responsibilities are not fun. Being a responsible human being, it takes, you have to toil, you have to work. So we say, so now what happens? People, they uh, absolve themselves. I've gone their responsibilities. How many cases do we hear about people where they say that, you know, his father walked out when he was young, he doesn't know who his father is. The guy just walked out. Why? Because this is getting in the way of my happiness. I can't take it. This is what it's led society to. It's led society to people absconding their responsibilities to their families, to society. That is why in Japan, there is actually now a psychological term for this. It's called hikikimori. Basically, postmodern hermits. People that have no ailment, they have no ill, they have no sickness, nothing wrong with them mentally, but they can spend up to six months sitting in their basement playing video games and eating pizza. This is actually a problem, it's an epidemic. It's called hikikimori. They'll spend six, no, nothing, they'll no work, they don't add any value to society. They're just consuming. Why? They need that short term pleasure. They can't get themselves to take the Difficulty of getting up and working and being a productive member of society. Number three, short-term pleasure addiction leads to all kinds of addictions. Right? Whether it's drugs, whether it's gambling, whether it's all these different kinds of sexual perversions, all of this stems from an addiction to short-term pleasure. 
short, you know, and this makes me happy, so I'm going to do it. Now, you might be thinking, okay, so all these people are running after these short-term pleasures. That has nothing to do with me. I'm going to live my life good. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, but, you know, there's a beautiful saying of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. In his very first khutbah after he became Khalifa, what did he say? He said, وَلَا يَشِيعُوا وَلَا يَشِيعُوا الْقَوْمُ قَطُّ الْفَاحِشَةَ إِلَّا عَمَّهُمُ اللَّهُ بِالْبَلَاءِ that whatever fahisha and immorality and these things, they plague these society, the effect of that will hurt every single one of them. Don't think that I'm going to sit here and let the LGBTQ do what they're doing. It has nothing to do with me. It's going to eventually do something to you. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala is going to touch everyone. That bala and that consequence is going to come on everyone. We have all of these social organizations that are there to help people with addiction, to help people with gambling addiction, to help people with all of these different kinds of sexual addictions, and all kinds of problems, right? All kinds of mental issues, drinking. But what do you do when everybody in the society has that problem? Before everybody put a little bit of money aside to help those kind of people who fell into this dark hole. But now the whole society is in that dark hole. So it affects everyone. It drains the social resources. And finally, it leads to... Oh, there's another thing that... Uh, this is a strange one. There's something called the loss, loss of happiness. It's a paradox. When you get addicted to short-term happiness, there's a loss of happiness. There's a loss of happiness. What is a... Because human beings, we require a purpose beyond immediate pleasures. When we have a purpose in life that leads to the wholesome happiness. Psychologists, they call it like a, like a wholesome happiness. When we don't have that purpose in life, we don't have that objective in life, our whole purpose of our life is these short-term pleasures. So then our we actually experience a loss of happiness in life. People become depressed. That's why we live in a society where we have more money than we ever had. We have more you know, amenities and luxuries and everything that we could ever need. But depression rates are still high, suicide rates are still high. And they're growing actually. Why is that? Because short-term pleasures don't lead to happiness. That was a lie that was told to us by liberal philosophers. That happiness equal, I believe it was Bentham who said that, it means pleasure. No, happiness does not mean that. You have to have a purpose in life, right? A deeper purpose to make your life meaningful. And also, a, this short-term pleasure addiction, or we can say hedonism, it also uh, it disrupts social cohesion. Go to a society where everybody is addicted to short-term pleasures. There's no respect for the elder. There's no care for the neighbor. There's no connection to family. It leads to sort of an individualistic lifestyle, which is a third thing mentioned in the hadith of Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala Right? Why? Because all of these things take a little bit of effort. They take some discomfort, right? To get up and respect somebody. To go and worry about your neighbor and your community. Right? To make that zahmat and to go out of your way to make sure that the other person is okay. But now everybody lives in a society where, no, no, I have to be in constant bliss and happiness. Forget about what the other person is. Why should I show him respect? Forget him. Who does he think he is? So it leads to a breakdown in social cohesion as well, hedonism. The reason I'm mentioning these three, four things for each one is to show you that they're transitive. Don't think that, oh, okay, we shouldn't should follow our desires yeah, because Allah Ta'ala said that's bad. Allah Ta'ala said it's bad, but there's consequences in this life also, not just consequences in the hereafter. Not just consequences in the hereafter. So, uh, the thing we're talking about is, yeah, hedonism. And also leads to social isolation. Right? When a person is only worried about his own personal happinesses, then he becomes isolated. He's not worried about anyone else. He's not, he's not, you know, let them worry about their own happiness. Let them worry about their own business. I'm not going to get into that. And that leads to individualism. What is individualism? What is individualism? And you, you might be thinking, well, the hadith doesn't say individualism. The hadith says, There's a deep connection between that 
and individualism, hyper-individualism. There's a certain level of individualism that's fine, right? Your personal ibadah and things like that. There's a personal aspect to Islamic teachings. But hyper-individualism, which is the sort of society that we live in today. We don't live in a communitarian sort of society. We live in an individualistic society where everybody's cut off from everyone else by and large. There's a lot, there's already that loss of social cohesion. How many, how many of us actually know the names of all our neighbors? Back home you'll know all your neighbors and you know everybody in town. You know everybody in the next town also. But here you don't know, you rarely know your second or third neighbor even. This is social isolation, everybody becomes isolated. So individualism, Alama Jurjani rahimahullah ta'ala in At-Tarifat, he defines what is i'jab. So what does he say? He says, هو عبارة عن تصور استحقاق الشخص رتبة لا يكون مستحقا لها. That it is an expression of a person's tasawwur, a person's almost like a delusion that I uh, am due, I'm entitled to a position which I'm not entitled to, which he's not really entitled to. That's what i'jab is. That's why Alama ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says that i'jab goes in contradiction with iya kanasta'in. That a Muslim and a believer, he says, Oh Allah, it is only you we seek help from, but the person who is full of i'jab, right, ujb, that person will never turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he himself is the end all and be all. He has replaced Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mentioned in the beginning of the talk that Western society, right, after enlightenment, they replaced God, they removed God from the picture. We talked about atheism in one of our conferences. You remove God from the picture if we remember anything from that. We can remember this much. That there was a concerted effort, let's move God out of the picture. So that He doesn't have to tell us what to do, what's right and what's wrong. And now it's replaced by these things, by greed. It's replaced by pleasures and pains. It's replaced by the individual himself. And I'm not making this up. John Locke, who was one of the foremost like liberal philosophers, like the half of the American Constitution is based on his writings. So what does he say? He says that man is the absolute lord of his own person and property. Man is the absolute lord of his own person and property. Meaning the individual now gets to decide what is right. The individual gets to decide what is wrong. The individual decides that what the purpose of his life should be. You decide what you want to be. Don't we hear that often nowadays? Where does these slogans come from? Sometimes you see a lot of these slogans, I want to be free. What is it? There was a slogan in Pakistan not too long ago, the many just and many mazi or something like that. My body, my choice, my body, my choice. This was like a feminist sort of a slogan that was taking place in Pakistan. Really? Does a Muslim believe that? Do you really believe that your body belongs to you? How do you know it belongs to you? Well, because you control it. So if I go, steal something and in control of it, it becomes mine, I am the owner of it. No, the one who created you, the one who fashioned you, the one who, he knows every detail about you. He sent the manual, which is the Qur'an. He sent Rasulullah to teach you what is going to work, what is good for you, what is bad for you. Now you're trying to decide for yourself what is good for you and what is bad for you. Recipe for disaster. And it is, look where it's left us. Individualism. Now we've elevated the individual, right? What you say is like gospel. What every individual thinks, this is my truth. How often do we hear that slogan? This is my truth. You decide what is true now. Why? Because you are not only the Lord of your person and property. That's what he says, person and property. Every man is the Lord of his person and property. And it gets very philosophical. I won't even go into it. So we have replaced Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the self. I'm going to end up, we don't have a lot of time. I'm just going to list off where these sicknesses have left our society. Where have these sicknesses left our society? This greed and unbridled, unfettered, capitalistic pursuit and love of wealth and money. <coughs> this hedonism, this worship of desires and short-term pleasures. And number three, this individualism, this ujb, this belief that I am everything. 
I am everything. It has been too, it's led to its own problems. You know, like, uh, this sort of isolation, it, hand in hand, it goes with hedonism. That, I know what makes me happy and I'm going to pursue what makes me happy regardless of what anyone else thinks. It leads people into the state of nature. John Stuart Mill, one of the greatest philosophers in the Western academia, he talks about a state of nature. It's mythical, it doesn't make any sense. He says that human beings initially, they were in the state of nature, where it's every man for himself, every man against every man. Everybody is fighting for their, basically for, for their own pleasure, right? It's a terrible life, it's short, it's brutish, right? Because everybody is, basically every man is against every man. The resources are there, whoever can get to it first, it's his. And the other one has full right to it, just like you have right to it, so you have to fight it out, battle it out. And then this is how he builds his case for how government came, that people came together and they gave up some of those rights and blah, blah, blah. We won't get into that a philosophical part of it. But Islam, we don't say that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings. Human beings, even if you, archaeologists will tell you, they were hunter-gatherers, they lived in communities, they were communal animals. There was never a time where human beings were just running about in the jungle individually, all killing each other. No, they were in communities, they, they were cohesive units. But, if we do not take care of these ills that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have told us about, it will lead humanity to the state of nature. We will end up in a society where everyone hates everyone else, nobody's life matters, nothing has value, only money, only pleasure. That is the society we're going to end up in. Where, when a little spark of fear, I remember in COVID time when the, when the, when the COVID started, and people were fighting each other, neighbors, blooding each other for the toilet paper and things in the store. Because me, 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 it has to be me. I have to worry about myself. So it leads human beings to that state of nature. Where has it led our society today? I'm just going to read off some statistics and some facts about where our world is today. There was a beautiful article written by him. It, it was an article written by uh, Michael Boner. Uh, called the problem of hyper-individualism. Now he mentions hyper-individualism, but there is play of greed also in there and there's a play of hedonism also in there. He mentions that, well these are a lot of other facts, uh, there's a, the Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, he sounded the alarm about what he called the public health crisis of loneliness, isolation, and lack of connection in the country. Meaning this is a national health crisis. Isolation, loneliness and lack of connection is a health crisis in America. People feel lonely. People feel isolated. Imagine, they don't have God in their life, but they don't even have other relationships in their life. That's why their lives feel meaningless. The Department of Health and Human Services released Exposition of America's Social Problems, and what did they title it? They titled it the Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation. I mean, it has reached epidemic levels, right? We talk about epidemics and yeah, COVID and this and that. But these are also huge problems. And don't think that, okay, people are lonely, so what, who cares? This has a whole bunch of social implications. These are leading to a lot of problems in society. Remember I told you in the beginning that these ills are transitive. One leads to the next, which leads to the next, which leads to the next. That's the nature of a major sin, that it leads to you know, the, de so the, the degradation just cascades down, downwards. Marriage rates, fertility, and household size, sizes have all declined dramatically since the mid-20th century. Social networks are getting smaller. There's no more family. There's no more, uh, any fertility rates are decreasing. Now it's about, I have to worry about my career, I have to worry about my, uh, my freedom. That's why I don't want to have children. I don't want to be, get married because then I have to worry about taking care of the family. I want to pursue my career. A lot of women, you hear that saying now? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed your happiness in one thing. Society in the West has told you your happiness is in another thing. And you're running after that. And they end up old, lonely, no children, no happiness. This is where it's, left, it's, le it's leaving them. And they're admitting it. And these studies are being done and it's telling them that this is what's making you depressed. But shaitan... Shaitan is a 
He's, the, the, he's like a politician, the politician I was talking about in the beginning. Right? He has convinced us that none of these are still the things of value that you need to be running after. Time spent alone is rising. Three in ten households consist of one person. That's a thing in the West. You know, in the back home, you go to a house, and there's like 20 people almost always at home. Right? Over here, this is a Western concept, right? Where everybody has to have his own place. And nowadays, people have their own place, and they're the only person in that place. Because they don't have any... All their friends are just, you know, social network friends they never met in real life. They don't have any impact in their real life. Right? As long as they're sitting in front of the screen, it's benefiting them, but as soon as they're away from the screen, their life is lonely. They're already dead. They're already in a qabr. Ana baytul wahda. It's the hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when a person is put in the grave, this is one of the announcements that the grave makes. That I'm the, great, I'm the house of loneliness. Today the people are living in houses of loneliness. There's a big epidemic, I think it's in Japan, of old people dying alone in the house. There's actually a whole industry built around it. These companies that are built, that they're all, their whole, the way they make, is that they go into these homes where old people have died alone, and their body, you know, was sitting there rotting for months. And it only gets known to people that somebody died in this flat or this apartment from the smell. And then they come in and they clean up. There's an industry built around it. This is the society we live in today. This is where we've gotten to today. Only 30% of Americans think that they can rely and trust one another. There's a breakdown in social cohesion that I talked about. Only 30% of Americans think that they can rely and trust one another. Otherwise, we're in that state of nature. Everybody's at everyone's throat. If push comes to shove, if there's any disruption of control, then see the condition. Right? SubhanAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the situation of our brothers and sisters in Gaza. I mean, they have been bombed flat, but there's still some social cohesion. People are still looking after one another. People are not robbing one another. They're not killing one another. Over here, just a little scare, and everybody's sitting on their porch with a gun, you know? We don't know. I don't trust anybody. There's a book that's written by Robert Putnam. It's called uh, Bowling Alone. He says that participation in clubs, civic societies, all of that has declined over the course of the last century. The number of men with no close friends has increased five-fold since 1990. The number of men that have no close friends. They have acquaintances, like somebody you see at the gas station, somebody at work. But actual close friends and acquaintances, people you share, who you identify with, it has increased five-fold since the 1990s. Suicides have increased in the United States since the end of the 20th century, as have deaths of despair. People dying of despair. Think about it. Suicide. And it's more prevalent, is double in women than it is in men. Even though women are the most free, and supposedly, and all of that, than they ever were in history. But the rates of depression and that are rising, double the rate that it is for men in today's society. Europe was found to be the most suicidal region in the world by gross rate. The most suicidal reg uh, region in the world was Europe. The average life expectancy in America has begun to decline. According to a recent Gallup survey, only 31% of respondents said that they had attended a church, synagogue, or mosque, or temple within the past seven days. We have, I mean, this is a common thing amongst Muslims, to go to a masjid once a week. This is like a Christian concept, right? To go to masjid on Sundays, or to go to masjid on Saturdays, or Muslims have chosen Friday to be the day that they go to the masjid on. Is that really what our Islam teaches us, to only go on Fridays? Or are we supposed to maintain a connection to the masjid? As soon as you don't maintain a connection to the masjid, we end up losing our connection to the light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. Where are you going to learn about Quran? Where are you going to learn about Hadith? Where are you going to be guided to do what's right? It's the masjid. You're not going to learn it out there. Even if you say, I'm going to learn it on the internet. You watch one video telling you something good, then you you're going to scroll down to the next one. And then you scroll down to the next one. We live in a very wild time. You know, nowadays on your, on your feed, you'll see horrific scenes of what's happening in Gaza, and then the next clip will come on and you find yourself laughing. What has happened? We've become desensitized to what's important, what's valuable, what's principled. This is where we are as a society. 
Percentage of teenage Americans who claim not to enjoy life or believe that their lives are not useful is now just, just under 50%. It's almost at 50%. They don't believe that their life is useful or has a purpose. That's why the suicide rates are so high. Because, okay, I'm existing. There's no purpose of my existence. And I'm also not happy. I'm also not living the short-term pleasure of life that I see on social media, all these rich people are living. So I'm also not happy. So then what's the point of living? Let me just go ahead and end it. Why live in this pain? It's a very dark society that This is like ظلمات في الدنيا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put first people who do not follow that light and the guidance that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought. And unfortunately, we as Muslims are in that same boat. So there's a book called The uh, Generations, and it talks about how there's hopelessness, despondency, and a sort of flatness that has overtaken the youth in the West. Flatness, emptiness, hopelessness, despair. What am I even existing for? That's why, on the flip side of it, there's a lot of people coming into Islam. A lot of people accepting Islam. A lot of people looking for some purpose, looking for meaning. People are accepting Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our Iman. Muslims who have that Iman are running away from it. Because they're running after the life that those people have. And those people are running away from that life for what the Muslim has. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is replacing us. Because we're not doing shukr for what we have. So in short, to close off today's halakah, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he told us 14 centuries ago that these are muhrikat or destructives. Thalath muhrikat. We only talked about three things. There's many mentioned in the books of uh, Islam. Thalath muhrikat. Today we see the truth of that characterization is manifest and is clear to everybody. We see the society we live in. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if these things prevail, this is the society you're going to end up in. Those things have prevailed, that is the society we're living in today. So what do we do about it? What should we be doing about it? There are two things that we have to do. And they pertain to ilm and hal. One is knowing, right? That's what we're doing right now. We're educating ourselves. Then hold on. This is a worldview that leads to destruction. Now that we know that, what should we do? Now we have to make sure we live our life characterized by the knowledge that we have that these things are destructive. We must make sure that we do not follow in their footsteps. Right? فَهُمْ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ يُهْرَعُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, right, talking about the kuffar, that they ran, they hasten, they're running after their forefathers who are misguided. فَهُمْ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ يُهْرَعُونَ Unfortunately, that's our case today. We're not running after our forefathers who are guided, we're running after other people's forefathers who are misguided. So we must, in essence, reject these worldviews that tell us that this is the way to live and this is the way of success, this is the way of happiness. And we have to turn back to the worldview of Islam. We must embrace and bring our lives back onto the Islamic paradigm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us tawfiq. Jazakumullah khair for attending, inshallah. We'll have a few minutes. Hafiz Fahad is going to update everybody in Shana, the community on what Project Yahya has been up to. Um, and because uh, sometimes, you know, people might think like, well, what are you guys doing? And we had conferences, we had a few talks and things like that, but that's not all that's going on. Inshallah, he's going to uh, just lay out where we are. And also, we also want to ask the community to help out a little bit. A lot of things that we are trying to do and push forward with, you know, we are in need of funding, to say the least. I mean, we're, we're making it, alhamdulillah, but we want to take it to the next level, and uh, we need the community support in that. But right now, we just want to present uh, to everybody what Project Diya is doing, what is involved in, inshallah. We encourage everyone to help as much as you can. And we, inshallah, we'll have, obviously, as we mentioned in the beginning, more programs like this, uh, more consistent programs. We have our... He's going to explain it, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.